to keep it moving quickly, could I open the floor? Does anyone have a question? Julia, you're going to have to worry. <laughs> Glad you have your tennis shoes on. <laughs> In the meantime, I wanted to thank you. I didn't give you the proper acknowledgement for such an outstanding talk. Thank you so much for that. Yes. So this is the guy, uh, the guy up in the corner. My name is Per Anglistam. I work at the School for Forest Management at this university. And I attended a, a meeting in Paris um, just before Christmas, uh, organized by many organizations about um, landscapes. There was a global landscapes forum. And um, a very important conclusion of this meeting was that there is a lot of um, good policy, but how do you make it land on the ground? And people discuss very much landscape approach. So really bringing people together, bringing in the disciplines, as we heard, and also bringing in stakeholders. So actually, what are your intentions of, of achieving this in reality, on the ground? And what are the resources for that? If, if you ask us, uh, I, I think that this is something that everyone is struggling with. Uh, we, are, we are addressing that very forcefully in our program to deal with that, with both providing background material for, for um, you know, policy development and technical things, as I said, and also I think one of the of the aspects, it's, it's a long-term perspective, and that is that we, we really try to build capacity in, if you call them, low-income countries to influence domestically in, in their countries. I think that is a, is, a, is a very important element that is not only people from, from, uh, from uh, Sweden or, or OECD countries that are, are coming up with background materials for, for, for policy development. So it's a very long-term perspective and it's a hard one. Any other questions? Thomas Roosevelt? Thomas Roosevelt, former Vice Chancellor of this university. I also chair the CCAF's program on CJIR for six years. Uh, and I want to ask all of you to reflect a bit, or a few of you to reflect a bit on this question about smallholder farmers. Because you said correctly that the farms are getting smaller and smaller. But when I listened to Ulf's comment, it was to also not only close the yield gap, but also ensure a larger farm. And of course, you won't get one ton per hectare for an half hec on a half hectare farm. And this was something we discussed in CGIR a lot, this focus on small holder farmers. What do we mean by that? What is the strategy for make, making the farm provide the livelihood, access to markets and everything that has been mentioned. But can you comment on the size question? How do we move from the farms getting smaller and smaller to something that's socially viable? Because these are not. And if it doesn't become socially viable, people are going to move into, continue to move into the cities and there are going to be no farmers left to handle the half hectare farm. So, Thank you for your question, and it gives me the opportunity to bring the other comment on smallholder farmers. So when you look at smallholder farming, because of the risk, the, the, small, the farmer is not sure whether it's maize which is going to give or banana or, may, um, or, or beans. So you tend to see mixed cropping in smallholder farming. So I think if we were to support smallholder farmers to ensure that you're going to have your crops are going to be giving the yield that you need. You have the right maize seeds every year. Mixed cropping will reduce. And then farmers will have more options on to what it is that they want to grow. Because productivity sometimes is because the farmer is trying to do too much. Lack of productivity is because the farmer is trying to do too much. So I think if we begin to address that, then we'll get to a point where some farmers will be cropping only one or two things. And then we can see uh, um, the, the, what uh, is the impact of the size of the farm at that, at that particular moment. But I think the dream smallholder farmers is the one 
who has small piece of land trying to do very little in terms of how many crops they are, they, they are focusing on to maximize in terms of productivity. Okay. <laughs> Wait, sorry. Well, thank you. <coughs> Shall we? Shall, would you like to yeah. address that same question? Can we wait just one, yeah, one well, moment, just, please? Just Sorry. Well, f first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I thought that uh, Apollinaire Gikang made a fantastic presentation here going through, and it's really um, in a very short and succinct way presented a number of the issues, and, and they resonated very well with my own experience from, <coughs> from, from, from IFAD, so uh, I think you had a, a spot on analysis. Uh, on the smallholder farmer, I have only really two things to say. One, there has been a discussion a bit more some years back, but it's looming that do away with the smallholder farmers and go for big, big investments uh, to solve food security issue and then distribute the food that you produce in large quantities in large farms. Uh, I think you only need to look at South America to see where that would lead you. It will be a social disaster. You may solve the production challenge, but you will have a social disaster. So you need to take where you are with a smallholder-based farming system and have that developed. And there's not one silver bullet, it's a number of things. And Apollinaire, I think, elaborated on, on them. Uh, let me just say one thing in, in, in compliment to that. I heard the other day, and I haven't seen, had a chance to, to probe further into it, but one person, part of this program, Agnes Andersson Jurfeld, presented a study at the meeting last, was it last week or two weeks ago in SIDA, where she actually saw that, the, albeit small, the average size or smallholder plots in her sample, in her the country she studied, actually increased. So, um, and it'd be interesting to know more about that because clearly uh, I've seen from my own experience both tendencies and where you get to smaller and smaller plots, you have a problem. If there is a certain amount of, come, you know, as we have in our countries, and which would be natural to, to see with economic development that you would have a somewhat growing farm size, then issues are a bit different in terms of how you relate to it. But I think the answer is develop organically from the farm size you have with the various kind of you know, system, systemic approach that Apollinaire was talking about. And, and then you know, there will be also need for policy measures to sort of guide the, the development of the farm size. Please. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention one example. Um, I visited Tetra Laval, and they work with small farmers in Bangladesh. And the typical case was somebody who had a very small farm, maybe one or two cows, that would milk about two liters a day in the beginning of the project. Then there was training of the farmer, there was assured access to markets and the cooling systems. And gradually, they were moving up to about 20 liters a day, mm. which meant that they became more of a business. So this is to underline the fact that you need several different factors that work together, and also that you work across uh, uh, borders and across, uh, because this was together with the local authorities, but with the private company involved and uh, the smallholder. So there needs to be large cooperation on several sectors. Mm. Thank you. We have some <coughs> next in line. Thank you. Yeah, <coughs> Ivar Vigin uh, from Stockholm Environment Institute. I'm part of the Agri4C Academy <laughs> or the team. Um, w as as Ulf said, the Agri4C is very much um, an attempt to translate policy and uh, <coughs> well science to policy and um, management response that makes a difference on the ground. Now. I was thinking in, in your presentation, uh, reminded you of a, of, of a study we did on, on, on bioscience innovations in Africa, saying that there's quite a lot of things piling up. There's a lot of actually R&D that has enormous impact, potential enormous impact, and 
we, we don't we're not short we don't have a shortage of R&D sort of efforts but the problem is that a lot of this R&D is indeed demand driven but it's not business driven so a lot of it piles up in in institutions and never reaches farmers or or, or um, agricultural systems i wonder if you can sort of uh, comment a bit about that how how in in in, in your world do we sort of scale up and and, and we talked about, you talked about Tetra Laval there being an agent for for that sort of uh, connection to R and D, making it scaling it up to 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 um, to farmers. <coughs> so I think that is a critical area. How do we how do we sort of go from R and D to to an impact, and how do we incubate what's being on the ground? Thank you, thank you, um, Iva. I. I you rightly say, you know, we have, there's no shortage of R&D. It's not just in agriculture, it's also in human health, you know, where you have a scientist in one lab showing that you can diagnose a disease very easily with a small, uh, through a small PCR and a simple PCR and stuff. But the translation, research into use, is where the gap has always been. You mentioned the private sector. The private sector, you know, I read a paper in the New York Times more than 10 years ago, a big farmer saying, you know, for African trypanosomiasis, it's a disease of poor people, we don't even want to waste time, we would rather develop Alzheimer's medicine for dogs and stuff like that. Mm. So it is, it's always the, you know, we, we've talked about the private sector, but where the private sector does not see the incentive, there must be some other pushes. And I mentioned, the governments, you know, the, the notion of incubation. When we look at our innovation systems, what are the key players? If we leave that to private sector, the private sector, if it's not a ready-to-go market, they're not going to come. But we have to have other mechanisms where governments should say, you know, we want to invest in this area to put this research into use. So once you start, uh, to, to, when you, once, you tra once you transition or close that gap, the market becomes very obvious in terms of distribution and production of what you have produced and stuff like that, the private sector will come in. So the problem that we do have is not that the R&D, as you said, is not there. We have enough of it. We have so many things that we, have, we know and, and products that can be calibrated and sent out, but we need that push. And I'm still going back to um, social entrepreneurs to governments, you know, what is it that we can do? If you're looking at Nestle or Pfizer, they're not going to come tomorrow or Monsanto and stuff. They will come only when the market is there, but you need that last push. And you've been involved in, you know, in discussions with that in the innovation system. It's still an ongoing discussion, but we have to define the players and define incentives. But somebody has to be carrying the biggest weight, and I still go back to governments and some of the foundation to put an initial investment. And if you, if you see the global challenges that were set up by the Gates Foundation are now everywhere. They say in the global challenges, they're not funding projects that will work. If your project will work, if you know by 80% that your project will work, just channel it through the normal process. But they're funding things that are almost impossible. You know, this is where we have, we have to have some of these global challenges helping us to you know, to put our research into use. May, may I just uh, add one comment to that? Uh, I very much agree with what you said, but it was interesting from my own experience.